All right, well, I'm gonna go with chapter four. This is a direct continuation of, uh, from chapter three, uh, gave that fairly brief overview of the different kinds of uh, cells in the nervous system and then focusing down to the level of the neurons and remembering the anatomy of the neuron uh, with dendrites, cell bodies, and the axon. Uh, we have other questions that we wanna address about how neurons, the first question here, of course, is transmit information. The second question is how do they communicate with other neurons? And so this first question of transmitting information is an example of what we're gonna talk about is something happening inside the neuron. And information is transmitted from the dendrites as it receives an incoming signal from another cell into the cell body. And then that signal is then transmitted down the length of the axon. This is referred to as the nerve impulse, is the action potential that travels down the axon. Separate from that is that when a signal reaches the end of the axon, we know about the synapse that connects to other neurons. And in the next chapter, we're going to cover the nature of the synapse. So we asked that question of how do, they, how do neurons communicate with other neurons? In this case, though, we're looking at information transmission within a neuron and down the length of the axon, again, the so-called nerve impulse. And so let's have a look at the nerve impulse. First thing that we want to uh, have under our belt is the concept of an electrical gradient. And what we mean here is uh, the, this talk, we're talking about a distribution of electrically charged ions. So remember just some basic chemistry, uh, different uh, uh, atoms can have either a positive or negative charge depending on whether they have lost or gained an electron. And so if they have gained an electron, they have a negative charge. And if they have lost an electron, they may have a positive charge, right? And in those situations, those ions now possessing an electrical charge are unevenly distributed within and around neurons. And that uneven distribution is the definition of a gradient, right? So in a typical uh, neuron at rest, we have uh, a gradient that results in a slight uh, negative uh, di uh, distribution. And what that means is that there are more negatively charged ions on the inside of the neuron compared to um, the positively charged ions outside of the neuron. So if you were to add up all of the sum of all of those positive and negatively charged ions inside and compare that to the sum of the positive and negative charges outside of the cell, you would find a slight differential in the total voltage uh, in the form of 70 millivolts. And that differential is negative, so we're going to call this a negative 70 millivolt uh, differential, uh, referring to the idea that the voltage is slightly lower inside the neuron compared to outside the neuron, and that's where the, the negative comes from here, is we're comparing inside relative to outside, so the inside is negative compared to the outside. This is known, this, the presence of a gradient like this, an electrical gradient in particular, is uh, an, an example of what's called polarization, right? So polarization is what happens when you create this electrical potential by distributing uh, these, these charged ions in different locations. One of the things that's important about a polarized state is that, and the same is true about a gradient, by the way, is that nature does not like these kinds of polarized states. Uh, it's sort of like the basic laws of thermodynamics and increasing entropy. Uh, and this kind of distribution of cells has a, has a has somewhat below entropy. Nature always wants to increase entropy by distributing all of these ions and all these atoms uh, evenly all throughout the space. Uh, you know, kind of a simple, even really introductory level chemistry lesson is to take a beaker of water and put a small drop of food coloring at the top of that water. And of course, initially you see that it is unevenly distributed because most of that dye is located right there at the point where you added the drop, right? That's a gradient because it's an uneven distri distribution of molecules here. But if you wait over time, eventually those uh, molecules of the dye will begin to distribute themselves out throughout the entire uh, beaker. 
and eventually it will become an even tone of whatever color of dye you added to it, right? And that uh, is an undoing of that gradient. Now, in that case, that is more of a, a gradient of just uh, uh, certain kinds of particles that are unevenly distributed. It's not an electrical gradient, right? Instead, it's just a concentration gradient that there's a lot of molecules of the food coloring concentrated in one location compared to another, but over time, they even themselves out. Uh, yeah. So the same thing is going to happen, though, when it comes to neurons. Here we have an electrical gradient. We have an uneven distribution of positive and negative ions, and they want to even themselves out. But the core issue at hand here is that neurons have a, a cell wall, right? This is a barrier that is considered to be, uh, I don't want to say totally impermeable, right? Because it does have ways in which ions can move in and out of the cell, but the permeability of that cell wall um, is um, something that changes over time. And, and that means that sometimes it can lock down and prevent these things from, from, from uh, changing places. And sometimes passageways open up in the cell wall that freely allow these uh, charged ions to move back and forth. So at a resting state, however, um, so a good word for that, by the way, is called selective permeability. Right, that is, it the, the neuron can only will choose uh, when it wants to let certain ions in or out of the cell. Right? But out of resting state, the neuron is actually attempting to maintain this uh, polarized state of negative seventy millivolts. That is the resting potential. The reason it's referred to as a potential, as a form of a state, is to think about energy. Right. It's the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy, right? So if you were to hold an object, I'm just going to grab my pen here, right? See, if I, if I hold the pen uh, above the, the, my desk, it has potential energy, right? And if I let go and it falls, that potential energy becomes kinetic energy as it falls, right? The idea here is that when we maintain this electrical gradient of negative 70 millivolts, there is potential energy there, but uh, in order to release that energy, there has to be a way in which those molecules can start to move. It's the same thing that happens when I let go of the pen, right? I have now released it and that becomes kinetic energy because something's gonna happen, right? And so the same thing is happening with neurons here is that as soon as we um, uh, change the selective permeability of the, of the cell walls, we might see that so we might see something happening, right? Some action occurs and then that potential energy becomes kinetic energy, right? So we actually generate some kinetic energy at this point. What ions are we talking about specifically? Well, in order to maintain the resting state, we need to talk about four different kinds of charged particles here. Um, there's, yeah, if we wanted to dig down a little bit deeper, there might be a few other things like calcium uh, that we could talk about as well, but these four core components are sufficient to get us into the, um, the, the real uh, essence, essence of the resting state. So we have some positively charged ions, sodium, for example. So the, remember your chemical symbols, Na for sodium, uh, and potassium, K, is also positively charged. We have some negatively charged ions, chloride in this case, so that's Cl, and that has a negative charge. And we have some protein anions. And so that's why we're using the symbol A to talk about the proteins because those are called anions and they have a negative charge. So as it turns out, we have inside the neuron, potassium and proteins. Outside of the neuron, we find sodium and chloride. So you see there are both positive and negatively charged ions, both inside and outside of the cell, right? So like I said, it's not just about having only negative in the inside and positive on the outside, but rather it's just about a differential distribution so that if you added up all of the voltages of the potassium and protein ions inside of the cell, and then you got a sum and then compared that to the sum of the voltages of the sodium and chloride ions outside of the cell, you would end up with that negative 70 millivolt differential, right? So there's just a few more perhaps of those um, uh, protein ions inside, or maybe a few more sodium ions outside that are tilting that differential towards negative 70 millivolts. 
So let's keep on going. As I had previously said, the membrane is selectively permeable. And one example of that is that even though all of these ions can move back and forth uh, between the inside and the outside of the cell, it really depends on certain passages that may open or close within the cell wall. And as we see here, the sodium channels tend to stay closed as much as possible. And so when we have that resting potential of negative 70 millivolts, sodium channels are for the most part totally closed off. So that means sodium can't go anywhere, right? But what might happen is that potassium is allowed to leak out of the cell. Right, so we're going to have some uh, possible uh, uh, occasional potassium channels that open up here and there inside the, around the cell body. So because the pot potassium channels are open and because potassium has a positive charge, that means it's naturally going to be drawn outside of the cell, right? Because if we want to eliminate that polarized state, one way to do that is to pull some of those positive ions out of the neuron and pull them into the uh, extracellular space, right? The extracellular fluid is, is, is what's happening outside of the cell. And if we pulled enough of those potassium ions out, then we would actually even out the distribution of charges, right? And we would no longer have an electrical gradient. We would now have a even distribution of positive and negative charges. And that would be called a depolarized state. But as I said, the neuron does not want this, right? The, the neuron does not want to, to uh, go into that depolarized state. It wants to maintain that polarized negative 70 millivolts. So what happens if we let potassium leak out of the cell? It's gonna start raising the internal voltage compared to the outside. It's gonna take us away from that negative 70 millivolts. We have to do something about that, right? So here's an example uh, of this, right? On this picture, what we're seeing is we're seeing three different gateways in the cell wall of the neuron. On the left is the uh, K plus channel, that's the potassium channel. So as it says here, these will sometimes uh, be open, at least a few of them will be open in the cell wall. And that means potassium would be free to move back and forth, though primarily it's gonna move out of the cell, right? Because it has a positive voltage and therefore it's gonna wanna move out of the cell to, to that other uh, uh, place. And that's gonna even out the, the electrical uh, distribution here. On the other hand, sodium channels are closed. Something else that I should also say is the concentration gradient, right? Uh, because of the concentration gradient, there's more, pota there's more uh, potassium inside the cell compared to outside. So this is also an, like, just like that example with the food coloring, right? And uh, uh, the idea there is that uh, the, the, when you put that dropper of food coloring, it's going to, if there's an uneven concentration of it, but gradually it's going to disperse itself at, uh, equally throughout the beaker of water. And that's also something that's going to drive the movement of potassium here, is that opening up those potassium channels, they're going to want to even themselves out between the inside. And so they were going to try to find a way to even out the distribution of potassium ions inside and outside of the cell. Uh, by the way, I think I spoke misspoke earlier when I said it was an electrical reason, because in fact, um, in order to, um, uh, if, we, if we're actually uh, letting potassium ions out that have a positive charge, that would actually lower the internal voltage and take us further away from zero, right? So the electrical gradient is actually going to keep potassium in, but that concentration gradient is going to want to, the the potassium to leak out a little bit. And so that's actually what's happening is that potassium is gonna leak out of the cell very, very gradually and very, very slowly over time. So in order to, to counteract this on the right-hand side here, there's another mechanism that the neuron has called the sodium potassium pump, right? And so that's the Na plus K plus pump, right? And what, the, what this does is it um, takes, um, the, the potassium that it finds outside of the cell and it grabs onto it and it pulls it back and it sucks it back into the cell. So even though potassium might be leaking out of the cell, the sodium potassium pump is pulling it back in. And meanwhile, the sodium potassium pump also finds sodium that, that might be present in the cell and it kicks it out, right? 
So the sodium potassium pump is doing two jobs at once, right? It's pulling potassium back into the neuron anytime that might leak out. And it finds any stray sodium that might happen to be inside the neuron and it kicks it out of the cell. And it does this in an unequal way, right? It pulls two positively charged uh, potassium ions in while it kicks out three positively charged sodium ions. And so this is one of the core mechanisms the cell uses to maintain that negative 70 millivolt resting potential is because it's kicking out more positive ions than it's pulling in, right? For every two uh, positive ions it takes in, it kicks out three others, right? And so that's part of how we end up with more positive ions outside of the cell compared to inside. That's going to give us the negative 70 millivolts, right? So the sodium potassium pump is a, is a very important mechanism that the neuron uses to maintain its resting potential, right? It doesn't just happen automatically uh, in the sense that it just stays at negative 70 millivolts, but rather the neuron requires this pump to keep working and keep doing its job. This is, by the way, an important uh, metabolic function of neurons, right? This, uh, the function of the sodium potassium pump requires a lot of energy. And so when we were talking about how the astrocytes pull nutrients from the bloodstream to, uh, to provide uh, nutrients for neurons to, do their, to, to stay alive, a lot of the work and a lot of the energy consumption that neurons use comes from the sodium potassium pump, which is continuously driving uh, this, this uh, negative 70 millivolt state. This picture here is just uh, to help us maybe visualize uh, in another way uh, what these um, uh, passageways look like in the cell membrane. So the cell membrane itself are layers of um, fatty molecules. That's what the phospholipids are. They're fatty molecules and these protein uh, channels, right? So these protein molecules form these little gateways inside the cell membrane here. And they can open and close, right? So you can imagine they can constrict down and close to prevent anything from passing through, but occasionally they may open up, right? And so different protein uh, channels here uh, can, are shaped in such a way that they only allow certain kinds of, of atoms through, right? So there are the sodium channels that only let sodium pass through, and there are potassium channels that may only let potassium pass through. And the same for some of these other um, uh, uh, compounds. So this is a lot of text that kind of repeats some things I say, but I just want to make sure all of, all of this stuff is in here. So we have this continual action of the sodium potassium pump that helps maintain the polarized state. Uh, and so we're going to end up with these two gradients. As I said, we're going to have that electrical gradient, an uneven distribution of electrical charges, negative 70 millivolts. But we also have a concentration gradient, right? The concentration gradient is that there's more potassium inside, so there's an unequal, uneven distribution of potassium. There's more sodium outside, so there's an uneven distribution of sodium here as well. And so the, the neuron is continuously fighting against those gradients because, because like I said, in nature, uh, nature likes to even things out, right? That's, about, that's what increasing entropy is. And so by evening out the distribution of uh, uh, the concentration gradient of positive uh, of, of, of potassium and sodium, as well as evening out the distribution of electrical charges. Um, that's something that would just happen uh, fairly effortlessly uh, without the uh, membrane maintaining its selective permeability and using the energy of the sodium potassium pump to keep everything uh, distributed unequally. Here is a, a picture that kind of captures some of, of this, uh, uh, these, these gradients, right? So we see, for example, um, that the outside is mostly sodium, right? But there's a little bit of sodium inside of the cell. So you have not a total uh, 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 you know, differential there, right? So there's a little bit of sodium that you might find inside of the cell. And likewise, there's a little bit of potassium that you might find outside of the cell. Uh, and if we just open up all of the passageways in the cell, all of that sodium and potassium are just going to start changing places until everything is evened out. But because it maintains selective permeability, it can maintain this unequal distribution. And, and that's, again, where we see the sodium and potassium pump working, right? So it kicks out the three sodium ions, pulls in two potassium ions, and we maintain this gradient, and we maintain 
the electrical potential. So what happens if we stimulate the neuron, right? So this idea, go back to my example, where I have potential energy in the pen until I let go, and then something happens because it converts into to kinetic energy. Well, what is the event that allows the, the potential energy of the resting potential to become uh, an event, right? For something to happen, we get what's now we would call an action potential instead, right? Well, this refers to the stimulation that leads to uh, depolarization of the cell. So depolarization is about evening out the gradients, the electrical gradient and the concentration gradient, but especially the electrical gradient, right? So when we're polarized at negative 70 millivolts, to depolarize means to turn that voltage, get that voltage differential closer to zero, right? Now, in order to activate this impulse that depolarizes the neuron, neurons have a threshold, right? So a threshold means that the stimulus that, that comes into the neuron has to be just large enough to, to trigger a chain reaction, right? So if it's a small signal that just causes a sl slight little blip, this is what's really gonna happen. This, the stimulation is gonna open a few sodium channels, right? And because we're gonna open a few sodium channels, um, that's gonna let positively charged sodium come into the cell and that's gonna start raising the internal voltage. But if it doesn't hit the threshold, then the sodium potassium pump is going to kick that sodium right back out and we're gonna lower that, um, that, that uh, change in the cell's voltage back to negative 70, right? But on the other hand, if we, if we raise the internal voltage of the cell to the appropriate threshold level, this triggers a further chain reaction that causes more and more sodium channels to open. So now we get this mad rush of sodium just pouring into the cell that rapidly raises the internal voltage of the cell towards zero, right? And then we're going to rapidly depolarize. And then we get an action potential, right? And so that action potential involves that, as it says right there, the rapid depolarization of the neuron. Um, and then this triggers this, what we're calling now the nerve impulse, right? This is going to then be transmitted down the axon. And then when it hits the end of the axon, it's gonna trigger a synaptic communication with another neuron, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. So what are these channels now that are involved in the, the action potential. This is where we have to talk about voltage activated channels, right? So these, these other protein channels in the cell membrane are only activated when the internal voltage of the cell hits a certain voltage, right? And that's, that particular critical voltage level is the, uh, the threshold of the cell, right? So once, this, once the neuron hits the cell, or, sorry, once the, once the neuron hits that, that, um, that critical uh, threshold level of its internal voltage, because a little bit of sodium comes in and it raises that internal voltage up to that critical le level, that's going to activate these voltage uh, activated channels, right? And that's going to then cause all of those sodiums to start rushing in because these voltage activated channels are sodium channels. They only let sodium pass through. So we're going to have that happen here, right? And we got a picture of this, right? So what we see here on the top image here is the neuron at rest. So start at the, on the bottom of the x-axis there. Uh, we're at negative 70 millivolts and we're maintaining negative 70 millivolts. But what you're looking at here is, maybe you can see my mouse cursor on the screen here, is that once a stimulus has uh, started to trigger some um, sodium channels to open, the internal voltage of the cell begins to increase gradually. And we see it here hitting at around negative 70 millivolts. And then this may trigger this further chain reaction that causes the, the, the voltage act, uh, activated channels to open up and all of this sodium comes rushing in and we start to increase the voltage. We will follow this up the y-axis as we see the voltage get towards zero. But curiously enough, the cell is essentially overdoing it, right? We might think, oh, it's just gonna to go to zero and stop. But the idea is that this sodium comes rushing into the cell so quickly that it essentially overshoots the mark and causes the voltage to jump all the way here 
to, in this particular case here, all the way up to around positive 30 millivolts. That's going to trigger something else to happen because now we're polarized again, right? It's But it's now a positively polarized state because we have a bunch of um, sodium inside the cell, but we also still have all of that potassium inside the cell. So what we've now done is we've let a bunch of positive ions come into the cell, all that sodium. So now it's positively charged compared to the outside. So what happens next? Well, what we do is we let the potassium out, right? So now we're going to open up, we're going to close those sodium channels. So the sodium can't do anything anymore. And then we're going to open up the potassium channels. And what's it going to do? Well, because it's positive inside the cell, and potassium has a positive charge, it's going, to, it's going to leave the cell and go into that negative voltage space in the extracellular fluid, right? And that, of course, is going to then cause the cell to depolarize again, but now it's starting at the top of this curve. And as the potassium leaves the cell, we're going to keep following it back down the y-axis towards zero. But again, of course, it drastically overshoots the mark. In fact, it doesn't even get and stop at negative 70, it overshoots that and comes way down here below the original resting state. And then it gradually takes a little bit more time for it to return back to its negative 70 resting potential. So this little voltage spike where we started with the initial activation and go from negative 70 all the way to positive 30 and then back down to where we were beyond happens very, very quickly. One millisecond, right? That's one one thousandth of a second. So there, this could happen a thousand times a second, right? But of course, there's a little bit more going on than that because this graph actually is showing us the rate of sodium, but there's also the potassium exiting the cell and that takes some time, right? So let's uh, have a look and see what's going on with that exactly. So we have here this graph that shows us the... Um, the, st the stages here. So again, what we saw before is that um, the uh, we're at a resting state of negative 70 millivolts. This red dashed line at the bottom shows the threshold uh, level where we're going to activate our voltage sensitive channels. So uh, at rest, as we said, potassium may occasionally leak out of the cell. The sodium potassium pump is going to pull it back in and kick out some sodium and we're gonna stay at negative 70. But as soon as the neuron is, is stimulated and it crosses its threshold level, we're gonna activate the sodium channels. The sodium is going to enter the cell. And so now we're on the green part of the curve and we come up to zero, but we overshoot the mark. And then of course, it's time to close the sodium channel, which we see down here in the bottom, but now we're gonna open the potassium channels. Potassium will start to leave the cell very, very quickly. And now we're going to bring us down the yellow side of this curve as we drop again to, to depolarize the cell, hitting zero, but overshooting the mark, dropping down below uh, the, the original resting level. And then we enter into what is known as the uh, refractory period here shown in red. And what's happening here is that during the refractory period, all of the uh, ions that we were talking about are sort of in the opposite locations where we first started, right? Remember, we started with mostly pot, uh, potassium on the inside and sodium on the outside, giving us that negative 70 millivolts. But now we've let the sodium come in and we've let the potassium leave the cell. And so once we shut down all of these uh, voltage activated channels, suddenly everything is, is reverse of where we started. Now the cell is most, inside is mostly sodium and outside is mostly potassium. And in order to, to get it back, what do we do? Well, this is where we have to uh, activate the sodium potassium pump again. So very, very quickly, the sodium potassium pump has to start pulling the potassium back in and kicking the sodium out. And, you, and it does, it pulls in, um, uh, it pulls in uh, the, the, the three potassium, the three, what was that? I forgot already, right? The, 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 the kicks out three sodium and pulls in two potassium, right? And uh, in that case, we're gonna get us back to a negative 70 millivolts uh, resting potential, but that takes a little bit of time, right? And so the time it takes before we get back to the uh, negative 70 resting state is called the refractory period. But in fact, as we see from this graph, there are different kinds of refractory periods. What is a refractory period? A refractory period is a, is a, is a time interval uh, 
where a new stimulus cannot have an effect on the cell, right? And so when we're looking at the, the actual peak of that curve that's labeled here as the absolutely refractory, or just call it absolute refractory period, um, obviously it's in the middle of, a, of an action potential here. So no new input is gonna be able to do anything to the cell because it's already busy doing something. The relative refractory period shown in red is a period where it is possible to stimulate this neuron, but it's a little bit more difficult to do so because in order to stimulate the neuron, you have to raise the internal voltage to its threshold level, right? And when it's at negative 70 millivolts, it's somewhat close to that red dash line, which is the threshold, but in the relative refractory period where we're even further down towards maybe negative 80 or negative 90 millivolts, then, uh, we're further away from the threshold, right? And it would take a stronger stimulus to, uh, to have this uh, neuron fire another action potential again, right? It would take a little bit more uh, to, to get it to hit that threshold again, right? So it's still possible for, to fire it though, it's just more difficult to do so. So that's why it's called the relative refractory period instead of the absolute refractory period, right? So, um, as we had noted here, once we have the action potential, the sodium channels close, um, then the potassium channels open, uh, potassium uh, flows out of the cell, right? And then we have to use the, the sodium potassium pump to restore everything back to their original positions, right? So this is text that already explains what I had in that particular graph. This also explains a lot of things, right? After the action potential, we're in the refractory period, uh, so the absolute refractory period is, is during the, the real middle of the action potential when the, you cannot stimulate the neuron with a new stimulus, and the relative refractory period is where you would just have to have a, a, a really strong stimulus to activate it at that point. Now, where is this happening? Well, one of the things that we need to talk about here is that the, the sodium uh, that begins to enter the cell that might trigger this comes in because of the activation of receptors on the dendrites, right? Uh, but that positively charged uh, sodium collects into the cell body and it arrives at the base of the axon called the axon hillock. And if you have a large enough concentration of sodium ions at the axon hillock that crosses the threshold, that's, we're gonna, that's when we're gonna start to see the, the action potential travel down the length of the axon. So when we talk about a neuron firing its action potential, it's just not really a single spike of this, but it's rather a chain reaction of sodium channels and potassium channels opening and closing in sequence as they travel from the axon hillock all the way down the length of the axon, right? So that one millisecond little spike of, of sodium coming in and, and potassium coming out, um, that's actually something that is gonna take a little bit longer than just one simple millisecond because it's gonna to have to travel down the length of the axon, right? And we would also need to think about how long does it take to travel down the length of the axon? Well, that depends on how long the axon is, right? So as we have learned, the speed of nerve transmission down an axon is pretty constant in the nervous system, but some axons are fairly small, such as those that might, might be found in some parts of the brain, but some axons, like the motor axons from, come from the spine that then synapse onto your muscles, can actually be several centimeters long, right? They travel in long fibers down a nerve from a motor neuron in the spine to synapse onto a, 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 a muscle fiber in your foot, for example, right? And so that can be a fairly long axon, um, and it may take some time for that signal to travel that entire distance. This is called uh, propagation, right? So to propagate the signal, down the axon, we have to have this long, uh, uh, as I said, a cascading chain reaction of sodium and potassium ions opening in, or channels opening and closing. This is uh, maybe a relatively decent way to visualize that, right? So we're seeing the sodium channels in green, the potassium channels in red. And so as the stimulus arrives at the axon hillock, it travels down the length of the axon. So we see the arrow at the bottom giving us the direction of the action potential as these channels kind of open and close in a cascading sequence down the length of the axon, right? 
I said something earlier about the speed of the nerve impulse, right? So that, that we're going to transmit this nerve impulse down the axon, which is, again, remember in the peripheral nervous system, nerves are bundles of axons, right? So the nerve impulse here is actually really the action potential traveling down a nerve or traveling down a bundle of axons. This idea, though, uh, I've got some speed uh, numbers here, right? So, so one meter per second or even as fast as 100 meters per second. Um, but I have not told you the entire story just yet, right? Um, what we might think of here is that this could this might seem to be a very slow process if we imagine uh, sodium and potassium channels opening up gradually bit by bit down the entire length of, an, of a really long axon. It could be several centimeters long, right? How do we achieve these high speeds as fast as 100 meters per second uh, if we have to wait for all of these channels to open up continuously down a very long axon? This is where we have to talk about the myelin sheath, which I had previewed in the previous chapter and promised we would talk about it. And I said before that the myelin sheath speeds up the nerve impulse, but how does that actually happen? Well, as it turns out, uh, myelin is a fatty coating that wraps itself around the axon. And wherever there is myelin coating the axon, there are no sodium and potassium channels, right? But there are gaps in the myelin sheath. And in these gaps of the myelin sheath, you will find, these are called nodes of Ranvier here. Uh, these little gaps are places where you will find some sodium and potassium channels that can open up. So when we talk about on this previous slide here, the idea of the nerve impulse being regenerated at points along the axon, that's what's happening at the nodes of Ranvier, right? So at the axon hillock, you get this sudden electrical potential. And then what happens is that as it enters into the axon and it encounters a myelinated portion of the axon, it's going to jump down that axon until it hits the next node of Ranvier where it is regenerated by opening and closing a few more of the sodium and potassium channels, right? And when it regenerates the action potential, and then it jumps down the next little myelinated segment of the axon, right? And so this um, jumping of the nerve impulse from node to node down the axon, uh, here's a picture of that, by the way. Uh, so again, we see as the axon begins at the cell body, it's not labeled there as the axon hillock, but that would be the initial protrusion of the axon away from the cell body. The, the impulse is started, the action potential is started, it jumps down the myelinated segment, and then it hits the node of Ranvier and is regenerated with some so sodium and potassium channels that open and close, and then it jumps to the next node. And this is called saltatory conjunction, right? So in Latin, uh, salt, saltar means to jump, right? So this is a jumping of the action from node to node, right? This uh, is, is, it speeds up the process and it also conserves energy because you don't have to have so many of these sodium and potassium channels doing all of this work, right? Um, so how does it speed things up, right? Well, that jumping is uh, obviously a lot faster as it jumps from node to node. Uh, one example of this that can sometimes could be done in a classroom, for example, is to imagine, um, let's say you had, imagine that you lined up uh, 10 people and you wanted to pass a baseball from person to person, but you line them up shoulder to shoulder. So they're standing very close to each other and you handed the first person in line the baseball and they grabbed the ball and they turned and they handed it to the person next to them. And that person grabbed it and took it and gave it to the next person. That is a form of saltatory conjunction as the ball kind of goes from person to person to person, right? But it's not gonna go very far. Let's say it takes one second for um, the person to take the ball and move it, give it to their uh, partner on the other side, right? And so if you have 10 people standing shoulder to shoulder, this might span out a distance of, um, you know, maybe five or six meters perhaps, right? And, 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 and so the ball is not gonna travel very far. If it takes 10 seconds to do this, we're only gonna go five or six meters in 10 seconds. But what we can do is we can have these people stand 10 meters apart, right? 
And if these people stand 10 meters apart, now this entire group of 10 people are spanning 100 meters. And what they can do is that when the first person gets the ball, they throw it to, their, to the next person in line rather than hand it to them, right? And by throwing it to the next person in line, the ball quickly travels that particular distance. The next person catches it and throws it to the next person. And now if it takes 10 seconds to do this, we can get that ball to travel 100 meters in 10 seconds instead of just five or six meters in 10 seconds, right? So that's the, that's the argument here is that uh, um, we can, we're, we're just throwing the nerve uh, impulse, we're throwing that action potential from node to node and we're speeding it up. Little side note here is that there are some neural diseases that uh, damage the myelin sheath. And one example of that is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disorder that uh, results in the immune system attacking the myelin sheath of the uh, nervous system, uh, in particular in the peripheral nervous system. And uh, so, of course, as we have said before, we want to tend to, we want to try to maintain a blood-brain barrier so these immune cells do not come into contact uh, with with the with the neurons. But in this case, this is happening. Uh, this causes uh, a destruction of the myelin sheath and that results in, especially these motor neurons um, coming from the spine to the muscles to not work very well, right? And so the early stages of this disease, um, you know, there may still be some myelination remaining in the motor neurons, but there is a decrease in the signal strength that goes from the spine out to the muscles. And so we may become uh, physically weaker uh, as well as maybe losing some muscle coordination. But as the, degree, as the disease progresses, these motor nerves stop working entirely and a person becomes paralyzed, right? Um, so we don't want that. Well, there we have it. So that wraps up this particular uh, set of notes for nerve um, transmission, uh, right? And the nerve impulse in the next chapter, we'll move on to the synapse and nerve communication.